And uh, so I'm not sure what's going to happen with this Dhamma talk. I'm not feeling 100%, but I'm feeling quite good. So it should be okay. shouldn't be a problem. So we'll see what happens. So the, um, should we just get started, uh, Bobby? Yeah. Let's start talking. Okay, start talking here. <laughs> as, so as a monkey, you become a talking machine. They can put you on the seat and as you open your mouth and things come out. That's kind of a, either you're very quiet or you talk. That's kind of the monastic life for you. Huh? So the uh, topic for tonight's talk is putting first things first, yeah? Sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? Uh? <laughs> and uh, one of the ways of, there's many ways of looking at this, but one of the ways of for understanding what has to be put first uh, is to have right view about Buddhism, to understand the world in the way that the Buddha understands the world. Uh. Because if you understand the world in the wrong way, then uh, you are, of course, it's called delusion. Uh, and then you're not going to be able to make the kind of progress that the Buddha is talking about. Uh. So I'm going to talk a little bit about right view, but from a kind of maybe slightly unusual point of view, not the kind of usual way uh, that we talk about this, uh, and then see what happens when we, when we do this. Uh, uncertain what happens always, uh, don't know. So um, one of the things that I was always very important to me when I was kind of young teenager uh, trying to understand what I wanted to do with life yeah one of the things that always was kind of a big conundrum to me here uh, was what is the meaning of life what is the point yeah you look around you uh, you look at all the people uh, you look at people going through this process they go to sc they kind of grow up they go to school uh, they work really hard at university they get a degree or whatever it is uh, yeah sometimes they get two PhDs if they are really keen on on universities uh, kind of getting more and more common uh, inflation in uh, education uh, and uh, then they get a job uh, yeah they work really hard they have a family uh, and then uh, eventually when they have a family they get re they retire uh, and they kind of chill out for a few years. Uh, if you're lucky, sometimes you don't even get a chance to chill out. Sometimes you just kind of straight away, you are <coughs> finished. You're so tired. <laughs> but so you ch chill out hopefully for a while, and then you die. And I, for me, it was always so strange. It was so weird. What is this all about? What is the point of all of this? Uh, where is anyone going? Uh, and when I looked at people, and I tried to kind of look at them and see if they were really, were they really happy when they died? Uh, were they really content? Uh, had they overcome the problems of life? Uh, and it looked to me like they were pretty much the same way as everyone else. Nothing had really happened. Yeah, you go through this process, you come to the end, you look back and you think, whoa, what was that all about? It's a kind of weird thing, you just do what everyone else does. Yeah, because this is what life is like. We tend to do what everyone else does because it's kind of the trodden path. Everyone knows what that is. But sometimes in Buddhism, you need to be a bit rebellious. You need to think differently. And that different way of thinking is the thinking that the Buddha gives us uh, as the very first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, yeah, right view uh, is the very starting point. Uh, you get that right, then uh, there is a chance. You will head in the right direction uh, and you will make something more out of your life than uh, the average person. Uh. The reality is, I don't want to say anything bad about the average person because, you know, we all have to live and sometimes the average person is not so average anyway, it turns out. Maybe they live a really good life. Uh, but uh, the point is that, generally speaking, you have to think for yourself to make this work, to make something more out of your life uh, than otherwise you could make. Uh. So what is the meaning of life? Uh, and uh, it's very easy to understand. Uh, yeah, the problem is that we are looking in the wrong place. Uh. So uh, when you ask people, well, what would you like? Would you like more problems in your life or would you like less problems? Uh? Less, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. So it's qu obvious, yeah, it's kind of so obvious that you don't, you know, barely need to ask anyone. Would you like more depression in your life or less depression? Huh? Would you like more sadness and sorrow? Would you like less sadness and sorrow? Huh? Would you like more pain and discomfort or less pain and discomfort? Yeah, it's very obvious what the purpose of life is. It's to move away from all that dukkha. And then you have the other side of the coin. Yeah, would you like to be more content and satisfied in life? Or would you like to be really restless, always running around, never finding anything here? Yeah. Would you like to feel joy every now and again? Or would you like to have this kind of blank mind state which doesn't feel anything at all? Huh? Would you like to be generally more happy or generally more miserable? Huh? 
it's a no-brainer, isn't it? That's one of these kind of modern things. So it, because it is a no-brainer, this is what is so interesting, because everybody agrees about that. So how come the whole world isn't really, really happy and having left all the dukkha behind? Why is that? If it is so obvious what we're going to do, you think they all kind of solved it, yeah? And they kind of stopped and they, they started to kind of, they, they found that happiness that is there. Why is that? And the reason is because basically we are deluded. We have wrong view. We don't understand. We look for happiness in the wrong place. We look for the end of suffering in the wrong place. Yeah? And that is really the problem. It is this delusion, this way of thinking about things which is the problem. So we need to align our view, our way to look at the world, with the way the Buddha thinks about things. Then there is a chance we might find that right path. We may actually find the meaning of life itself. Optimizing happiness, minimizing dukkha. I lay duk you all understand dukkha? Suffering, yeah, dukkha, pain, suffering, problems, all of that. Uh, minimizing all of that, uh, maximizing happiness. That is obviously what we all want. Uh, when you look into your heart, uh, you look at how you feel about things, it's obvious that that's where we want to go. Uh, it can be summarized as maximizing happiness or something like that, maybe. Uh. So, uh, why? so what, what happens? And uh, what happens is that the biggest delusion that we have as human beings uh, is we forget about anicca. Anicca is a Pali word which means uh, impermanence, say some, yeah, maybe unreliable, uh, say other people, unreliable, impermanent, uh, not there when you want it, uh, yeah, it's something you can't really, uh, you can't grasp it in a, in a kind of way so that it's always under your control, uh, it's not under your control, uh, it's uh, anicca, it's something which really is out of control, that's what it means. Uh, and the problem we have in life is that we chase all of these things uh, that are out of control, uh, we chase things that can never be the way we would like them to be. Huh? And because we chase things that are out of control, we always end up disappointed. Yeah, at the end of the day, you cry, you wail, you feel really sad because life is going in the wrong direction. Yeah, sometimes you're happy, sometimes you're sad, like this ro emotional roller coaster that we're on. Huh? And life is like that precisely because we misunderstand uh, where happiness is to be found. Uh. So, what is it? that is impermanent. Uh, what is the problem? Yeah, what are the things that we want to kind of uh, watch out for? And what is impermanent, and this is so interesting, is it's actually very, very broad, but the most important part which is impermanent uh, is the whole sensual realm. What does the sensual realm mean? What is that? And sensual realm is everything, yeah? From the moment you wake up in the morning till you go to bed at night, uh, unless maybe you meditate or something, uh, yeah? All of that is part of the sensual realm. Uh. And then when you go to bed at night, you dream more sensual realm, yeah? Unless you have a really nice dream. Uh. Or that I heard a story of a monk, I'm not going to say who, but you can probably guess. And he was dreaming that he was bowing down to another monk. Uh. And as he was doing that, the Samadhi Nimitta, bang, come up. Uh, yeah? Samadhi Nimitta is a very powerful bliss. So this came up in the dream. And then he opened his eyes, yeah? because the bliss is so strong, you can't dream anymore. Yeah? So that is kind of a Dhamma, Dhamma dream, yeah? These are kind of really cool, really cool dreams. Uh, they're the best dreams. Just so much bliss, you can't sleep anymore, okay? And then you just meditate and you do all the, the things that these sort of monks do. Uh, these are kind of the super duper monks. Uh. So, uh, so basically, we're trapped in this realm. Yeah? And that realm, if you start to look around you, is everything pretty much in your life. It is obviously your uh, family members. Yeah? It's a terrible thing, but our family members are anicca. Ultimately, they are unreliable. Ultimately, they are impermanent. Ultimately, they're going to fade away and die. This is the reality of life. And yet, uh, we seek so much happiness through family members, through the relationship with other people in that way. Uh, and of course, that causes problems down the track. Uh. Friends is exactly the same thing. Uh. The everything uh, we own in this world, yeah, everything you own in your life, your house, your cars, whatever it is, uh, doesn't matter if you have a fancy car or not, uh, one day it's going to go. Uh, you may crash it or whatever, some crazy maniac drives into you uh, and your car is gone. Uh, and then you kind of cry. I remember when my brother, he had just got a, a new car, but when I was, when we was young, kind of our father kind of gave us cars. We were very spoiled brats, actually. Yeah. <laughs> we were spoiled brats. So we, we got not a, not a very fancy car, but a kind of ordinary, very ordinary car. And he, so he got this car, and of course the first person to drive his car was my father, yeah, because he has to test it out, right? That's what fathers do. So he tested out, bang, collision, and destroys my brother's car. And my brother was, oh no, my new car. <laughs> 
It's a small dukkha, but still, it is the dukkha is right there. Yeah. So uh, everything you own is impermanent. It's unreliable. It's going to disappear. It is subject to cessation. Uh, eventually, you ha you can't have it. Uh, your identity is impermanent. Uh, yeah, who you think you are is changing all the time. Uh, yeah, depending on your social connections, your wealth, your gender. These days, people change gender, so kind of certainly your identity changes then. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and so all of these things. Uh, always changing and of course when you die that really challenges your, your identity big time uh, your body uh, is impermanent uh, yeah uh, I, sometimes your body goes in the wrong way uh, yeah I, I used I have always spots on my face uh, and I, I'm not sure why they come out I, I, I'm still not quite sure why because I didn't used to have this for 30 years uh, so I look myself in the mirror I think jeepers all these spots uh, yeah impermanent uh, of course you're gonna have spots it's just way that's just life life for you uh, and then you put on a bit of weight as you go older uh, I'm going to tell you about all my defects now, huh? <laughs> all the downside. Huh? It's good to talk about your defects. And so your body is impermanent. Yeah, you never know. And then it sometimes it's very impermanent if you go down the street and some crazy driver, bang, goes into you, then it's super duper impermanent. Huh? And that is everything in our immediate life. But if you go beyond that, uh, those things are also impermanent. Yeah, if you watch TV, you see what's happening in the world, you look at Malaysian society, look at climate change, you look at Donald Trump in office, yeah, everyone is talking about Donald Trump, so I have to talk about him as well, I suppose. So, <laughs> it's uncertain, yeah, it's so uncertain that sometimes you see, you think, oh no, this is really bad. And if you get upset about the politics of the world, if you get upset about climate change, it is basically because you haven't understood Anicca. This is the nature of things. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do anything to help out. You should. We should all try our very best to uh, you know, be responsible and support the best politicians and try to... Th we should do that. But at the end of the day, uh, you have no idea whether what you do is going to work out or not. Uh, it may not work out. Uh, and you realize that from the very beginning, then when the it doesn't work out, you shrug your shoulders. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, that's life. It's impermanent. Uh, so you start to see how broad it is. Uh, yeah? You look at this BGF center here today, uh, and it's quite a nice center, yeah, when you come in on the first, on the, on the ground floor, uh, very beautiful down on the ground floor, uh, yeah, with the big Buddha statue and all that. Uh, but don't attach too much to the beauty, because one day it's going to be gone. Uh, yeah, uh, suddenly it's gone. Uh, and uh, this is the way, the teachers you have, uh, the people around you, the Dhamma itself is going to be gone one day. That is really scary. Here is one thing that upholds your life, that supports you all the way through, that gives you a sense of meaning. That too will be gone. Uh, I was reading out the Maha Parnibana Sutta in Perth, uh, both for the lay people and also for the monastics down there. This is the great sutta on the Buddha's passing away. Uh, very beautiful sutta. Uh, but the whole sutta is like the theme of the sutta is really impermanence. Uh, yeah, the idea that the Buddha is about to pass away. Uh, it's a very powerful thing. Imagine the Buddha passing away. Imagine the kind of attachment you have to the Buddha. Yeah, so, so it's a very kind of nice sutta to contemplate impermanence, the Buddha passing away. And then you have Venerable Ananda crying, yeah, because of that. Uh, and he was a stream mentor, still crying. That's how powerful that emotional moment is. Uh. So everything is so incredibly uncertain. Uh. And what it means when things are so uncertain, instead of searching for happiness in that place of uncertainty, uh, you start to look somewhere else. You start to live your life in a different way. You look for that contentment and happiness, that meaning of life uh, in a different place. Everyone looks for happiness in that world. Uh, yeah? Everyone builds up family, connections, wealth, all of these kind of things. Uh, and then they are on their deathbed. Uh, and when they are on their deathbed, they feel empty. They feel everything they have done has to go. Uh, it's a terrible feeling, yeah? You have spent your whole life building things up, doing things, making your life kind of with possessions and connections and family members and identity and whatever it is. And then you are on your deathbed, you realize everything you have done in this life was kind of, it was kind of wasted. Because now you have nothing you're going to take with you. In fact, the problem isn't that there's nothing you can take with you. The problem is often even worse. Because if we uh, put so much emphasis uh, on the worldly pleasures, uh, yeah, the sensual pleasures in life, if that is really what matters to us, uh, then what happens is that we also sometimes do bad things uh, to get those worldly things. Uh. So when you then come to your end, your end of life, uh, not only can it take nothing with you, you have created bad karma, so you feel bad about yourself at the same time. Uh. Double whammy. Yeah, it's really, really 
negative. Yeah, and that is the problem for most people in this world. So don't follow the footsteps of everyone. Think about life in a different way. And here is one of those similes. I'm going to give you one of the similes of the Buddha. Because the Buddha has so many similes and I have some of my favorite similes. And I, on, on the retreats I do, I read out these similes on every retreat. I think that's why some people don't come back on the retreat because they hear the same simile every time. <laughs> But the thing is that the Buddha, the way he teaches, he teaches by repetition, yeah? Because it takes time for these things to sink in. And, and I just love this simile so much because it really drives home this idea of right view, how to think about happiness in the right way. Yeah? And so what uh, he says in the simile is that, uh, imagine uh, there is a man, ordinary man, doesn't have much money, yeah? or a woman, whatever, it doesn't matter. Someone who don't have that much money, ordinary people. Yeah? And then one day, they borrow all of these things. And it's very sweet. This is India two and a half thousand years ago. So what he borrows is a carriage. A carriage is like a horse-drawn carriage. You've got horses in front and you sit inside behind. This was kind of the maximum luxury in ancient India. They were, I don't think BMW existed yet at that time. Uh, I don't think it's a BMW carriage, but probably maybe BMW started out that way as well. I'm not sure. Whatever. So. And then he had some jewelry, he had some jeweled earrings, according to the Sutta. And that was enough for him to feel really wealthy. Yeah? So then he takes that carriage and he takes those jewelry yeah? and then he drives around the city. And people say, wow, look at this wealthy man. Look at how the wealthy are enjoying their wealth. And as that happens, you start attaching to that wealth, yeah? Because you think other people are looking up to you. You think that, wow, this is really nice to kind of enjoy these things. You start to attach to those things. That is kind of what this is about. And then, soon afterwards, the owners come and they say, okay, you had your carriage and jewelry long enough, we take it back. So how do you feel? You feel naked. If you have attached to it, if you have identified with it, actually it's very difficult when someone then comes and takes it back again. It's very hard. So this is the thing. So this, what this means is that not only is our thing is impermanent in this very life, yeah, people can die at any time and things can go wrong at any time and all of these things, but the really big impermanence that is very good to reflect on, and the Buddha actually says we should reflect on this on a regular basis, is death. Death is max impermanence. If we want to max out on impermanence, that is death. Yeah. So this is a simile uh, for someone who is dying. Uh, yeah. The simile that you have to give back all the borrowed goods, you have to give back everything. Uh, you have spent your whole life building up what? Building up borrowed goods, uh, borrowed relationships. Uh, we think we own these things. Uh, yeah. You think you own your possessions. You think you. Uh, you think. You think that uh, your relationships are kind of yours and all of this, uh, but you don't own anything. Uh, nature owns everything. Uh, and when the time is ripe, nature will come and claim back all of those things that you borrowed from nature. Uh. So that's why death is so incredibly powerful. Death is the time when everything in your life has to go. Uh, and there's only one thing that you have left when you die. Uh. What is that? Karma, yes, that's one way of thinking about it. But you can think, let's think about it as your mind. Yeah, The mind is imbued with karma, so that's kind of part of the mind. But karma or mind is what you have left. That's the only thing that you have left. So if you want to avoid these problems, if you want to avoid the, uh, you know, the uh, emptiness and the problem when you finally pass away, uh, you have to think in a different way. You have to develop something else in your life. Uh, most people are not aware of this. Most people don't even know that it's possible to develop your mind. Uh, but your mind is the only long-term investment that makes any sense. Uh, everything else is short-term. Everything else is going to be lost. Everything else, you're going to grieve and be sad when it disappears from you. Uh, the mind will always go with you when you invest in your mind. You can never go wrong. Uh, and that is really a very, not everything, that's a very big part of Buddhism, what it is about. Uh, investing in the mind. Uh, yeah? And um, how, how do we do this? Uh, and it's actually fairly simple. Yeah? You probably know the answer already. Uh, but uh, one of the ways of doing this, one of the kind of powerful reminders in life is when you have big change happening in your life. You have some big anicca happening in your life. Uh, somebody dies in your family. Someone gets very sick. Yeah? big anicca happening in your life. Uh, now, most people, when these big impermanences happen, uh, they feel really upset. Uh, they feel really 
angry even. Yeah, nature is terrible, the world is bad, why do people have to die here? Yeah, people get very upset about these things. Uh, but there is an alternative way of looking at that impermanence. Uh, and that impermanence is to remember every time reality happens, and this is really reality, this is how it, what the world is like. Every time reality happens in this way, it's a chance for becoming a wiser person. Uh, would you like to be wiser? Wisdom is the highest, yeah? Who wouldn't want to be wise? I mean, it kind of makes more sense than anything else. Everyone would want, uh, certainly me, I think wisdom is kind of, gee, wisdom, yeah. Why? Because you can be, uh, you, you, you can have more happiness when you're wise, you can avoid more suffering uh, and all of these kind of things. Uh. So it is an opportunity, yeah, when you have these things. So sometimes when you get these shocks in life, uh, suddenly someone dies, uh, suddenly you lose your job, uh, suddenly your girlfriend breaks up with you, yeah, or whatever it is, bang, and you feel really empty, and you feel like, wow, so much dukkha. That is an opportunity to understand life. Uh, and the story that describes this very well is the story, Ajahn Brahm's story of good, bad, who knows? Uh, you know that story? Uh, does anyone not know the story? Uh, <laughs> you don't know the story, okay. Only one person doesn't know the story, okay. I will tell it because it is such a nice, nice little story. So I'll tell it anyway. So, and uh, the story, good, bad, who knows? Uh, this is an ancient story found in the Jatakas or the, or the Dhammapada, Atakata. Yeah, these ancient stories from Buddha, from, uh, from um, India. And uh, these have been incorporated in the Buddhist scriptures very often. And these are not the word of the Buddha, but they are nice stories nevertheless. And according to this story, uh, there was a king in a kingdom. Yeah, all, all kind of fairy tale stories have kings and queens and that kind of stuff. Uh, so this is a real fairy tale story. So this king has I in this kingdom, and then one day he hurts his finger. Uh, you know the story? <laughs> he hurts his finger, and then when he hurts his finger, he goes to his doctor. Yeah, if you are the king's doctor, uh, you better be careful. Uh, yeah, because kings they are powerful, uh, and they will kind of really make life difficult for you unless you get it right. Uh. So he goes to the, to the doctor and says, oh, my finger is really bad, please do something. Yeah, see if you can fix it up and sort it out. So the doctor has a look at it uh, and uh, the king asks him, well, how is it going to go? And the doctor replies, good, bad, who knows? It's a dangerous answer to give to the king, good, bad, who knows? <laughs> He's kind of already treading, uh, treading on thin ice, I yeah, was saying that. But, uh, you know, I come from Norway, so that's we have th we really do have thin ice in Norway. I know exactly what that is, and it's really kind of scary. Yeah, he's treading on thin ice, so he kind of looks at his finger. Okay, does his best. Yeah, takes away the pus, puts on some salve, salve or whatever, and then kind of wraps it up with a bandage. And and, and okay, okay, okay. Now you, I've done what I can. A few days go go by, and the finger gets worse. And the king goes back to the doctor, doctor, my finger is getting worse, yeah, wh wh what are you doing? Can't do, do something more. And, uh, and, uh, he's, and the, he, the doctor has a look at the finger and the king says, well, what's going what's gonna to happen? And the doctor says, good, bad, who knows? Yeah, cuts, cuts a, bit, a bit of the flesh, yeah, put the salve on again, wraps it all up and says to the king, okay, and now, you know, uh, that's, that's it, that's all I can do. Huh? And then uh, a few more days go by huh? and the finger gets even worse. And now the king is getting pretty upset with his doctor. Yeah, maybe it was some kind of dodgy doctor, I'm not sure. But the uh, king is getting really upset and says, oh, have a look at my finger. Yeah, it's getting really, really bad now. Huh? And the doctor says, oh yeah, that's pretty, pretty bad. Yeah. Um, we're going to have to chop it off. We're going to have to amputate. Uh, yeah. So, and then the king has always asked, well, is it going to be okay? And he again says, good, bad, who knows? So he chops off the finger. And by now, he is so angry, the king, that he chucks his doctor into prison. Huh? And the doctor kind of ends up in a cell on water and rice. Is that really bad in Malaysia, water and rice? The only thing you eat? That's kind of, is, that, is that what they have in prisons in Malaysia? Huh? What do they have? Huh? So, so Rice and curry, they get curry. Whoa, they are very fortunate. <laughs> rice and curry, okay, that's good. Good that you look after the prisoners. They're just ordinary people anyway, the prisoners, you know, make a mistake and then that will happen. So, so, so then, thro thrown into, into prison, yeah, and he's kind of behind bars looking out, yeah, trying to figure out what's going on. And while the doctor is in prison, yeah, the king goes out hunting. It's one of the things that kings do. They go on hu hunting parties, uh, yeah? So he has this large entourage, all these people going with him, uh, and he goes out and he goes hunting. Yeah. And while he is with this entourage, he gets separated from all his kind of um, attendants, yeah? And he's suddenly by himself. And then as he's by himself, this tribe of savages uh, see the king. 
Wow, let's say it's tribal savages. This is kind of typical fairy tale, fairy tale stuff. I don't know if they really exist, but anyway, fairy tale stuff. So, tribal savages, and they think this here is a king. If we sacrifice this king to our gods, our gods will be really, really happy. Yeah, nothing is better than sacrificing a king. It's so the grab hold of the king, pull him back to the village, have to have a big kind of solid uh, post, and they tie him to that post. And then after they have tied the post, they kind of dance. You know, you know what savages are supposed to look like? They dance around the post, yeah? It's all very stereotypical and kind of probably never happened. But anyway, dance around the post. And then after the dancing is finished, the drumming, whatever, then <laughs> they take the knife out. And now they're going to cut his throat. Yeah, he's going to die. But just as they're about to cut his throat, one of the tribesmen says, wait, wait, look at his hand. He's missing a finger. If he is missing a finger and we offer him to our gods, the gods are not going to be happy. It has to be a complete human being. Yeah, this kind of this is a sort of a half, you know, this this kind of dodgy human beings are not, not not good enough. It has to be complete with all the limbs and everything intact. And so they think, oh yeah, you have a point. Yeah, the gods will be angry if we do this. That's even worse. So they untie the king and says to the king, okay, off you go. Yeah, and. Um, uh, then uh, the uh, king goes back to his palace again and goes back to everything. Yeah, and uh, then he goes down to the cellar. And when he goes down to the cellar where the doctor is kind of imprisoned, uh, he goes up and he bows down to the doctor and said, "Thank you, doctor. Thank you. You are the best doctor in the universe. You you saved my life. Without you, there would be no saving of a life." And the doctor says, "Good, bad. Who knows?" <laughs> or something like that. And this is such a beautiful simile for life. It sounds like a kind of funniest, typical Adam Brahm story, but it's a, you know, it's a simile for life because we don't know the outcome of things. You go through a really hard time. Someone, as I said before, something goes wrong in your life. You have a really, really hard time. But somehow, because you are wise about it, because you use it, you kind of carry on, you get through it, you learn something about life. And when you learn something about life, what you are learning really is right view. You start to see the world for what it actually is. And you understand that all of this building up of external things, the building up of things that are impermanent, it's crazy. I have to look for real happiness somewhere else. Uh, that is the point of this. Yeah? Good, bad, who knows? In the long run, big calamities can actually be quite useful uh, because they change your view about things. Uh. So uh, what does this mean? What does this mean insofar as how we should live? Uh? Does it mean that you have to shave your head and become a monastic straight away? Is that what it means? Uh? I might not get that. If that's the case, you, you know, I might be wasting my time, right? Because I'm not sure how many of you are ready for that. But um, is that what it means? Not necessarily. What it means is that we start to think about life in a different way. Instead of thinking about all the things, the, the end result, where we're trying to go, building up all, all of these things. Instead we think about the process, how we do things in our life. Because when you think about the process, how you do, how you do things in the life, you're actually, that is what it means to cultivate the mind. So if you do the right process. What is that process? Well, it's being kind. It's being generous. It's to avoid harassing people and make giving people a hard time. Yeah, this is what it is about. Because everything you do in that, in the how you deal with the world around you, all of that is what builds up your mind inside. And it's very easy to say. This is another thing I always say on these retreats. It's very easy to see this. Because how do you feel if you really are kind to somebody else? If you're really coming from your heart and you do an act of kindness, how do you feel? You feel good. I feel good. If I tend to feel good if I do something kind to somebody. I say, here you are. It's like you are giving up something of yourself and giving it to someone else. Every time you use right speech, Every time you really care for somebody else, uh, you're actually building up that positive feeling inside. Uh. And what is so astonishing about this is that these feelings, if it is worldly, sensual pleasures, then they just come and they disappear again and there's no kind of, doesn't leave any imprint on the mind, it doesn't do anything for you. Uh. But these kind of happiness that comes through living well, or living in the right way, it leaves an imprint on your mind. Uh. And every time you're doing good action, every time you avoid doing something bad, it's like you're lifting up your mind one step. Yeah? Your mind gets kind of more bright. 
and then maybe you lose a bit of that energy, but generally speaking, you're on this curve going upwards, your mind becoming brighter and brighter and brighter, more and more beautiful. Because, why? Because that is what happiness is. Happiness is this lightness inside, contentment in your life, all of these positive things. So this is what the spiritual life is all about. This is what it means to understand where happiness is to be found. It is not what we do in the world matters, it is how we do it. You can do anything in this world, if you do it with the right heart, then you are going to have a good life, then you're going to be, you are going to have success in a real deep way. And then when eventually you die, yeah, you're on your deathbed, and you think back on your life, you're going to feel, wow, I lived my life well. I have changed my life, I'm a different person from what I used to be. I, and you feel, instead of having wasted your time on just building up material goods, you can build up material goods as well, it doesn't matter, but at the very least, you have also built up your mind. Uh, and when you see that, you feel content, you feel happy, you can die in a good way. Even if you don't make it all the way to Nibbana, and most people don't make it all the way to Nibbana, at least you're on the right track, uh, heading in the right direction, uh, and you're using your life wisely. Uh. This is the idea of right view. Understand where happiness really is. Uh. And this is quite difficult to do. Yeah, are you able to do this? It's kind of hard to do this consistently all the time, keeping on in this way, doing what is good, being kind to others, never doing bad things. Actually, it's quite hard. So you have to kind of keep on doing it, coming back to the Dhamma, understanding these teachings, strengthening that right view, brainwashing yourself. Is that right? Brainwashing. It's good, yeah, as long as you have the right soap powder and that, that sort of stuff, then brainwashing is good. Make sure you get the right soap powder, the Buddha soap, Buddha brand, yeah? <laughs> that is the best one. Huh? Then you get brainwashed, you get cleaned out inside, and you start to have a view of the world which aligns with Buddhism. You are brainwashed anyway, we're all brainwashed, yeah, whatever it is, you've got to be brainwashed somewhere, so you might as well choose the good brainwashing, that's what I reckon. So you choose the good brainwashing. Adam Brahm used to say, have you come here to be brainwashed? I went to his monastery, have you come into a monastery? I said, oh, I'm not so sure about that, uh, that's what I said. But then I realized afterwards, actually, it's a good thing to be brainwashed, uh, if you're brainwashed by the right thing, uh, that's the point. Uh. So make sure you get a, a, a continuous, not continuous, but a regular input of Dhamma, because that regular input of Dhamma is what will able t enable you to sustain your practice, enable you to be kind to people around you all the time. Uh. And uh, I try to do that myself. I read the suttas uh, quite regularly because I do so many retreats. I have no choice but to read the suttas. Uh. <laughs> so I do read the suttas quite regularly. But also I visit some of the really inspiring monks. Uh. And I would re recommend you sometimes to visit some of these really inspiring monks or nuns, yeah, for that matter. Uh. And uh, recently I went to visit a monk in Thailand, uh, Ajahn Ganha. Yeah, some of you have heard of him, some of you have not. Uh. But he's this incredibly beautiful person. Uh. This radiating kindness is coming out of him as if you can almost touch the kindness. Yeah, it is so powerful, uh, but peaceful at the same time. Uh, he never gets agitated, even when the whole world around him is kind of jumping up and down and everyone is kind of really busy. Uh, he's cool, cool as ice. Yeah, nothing happens with him. It just doesn't, there's no emotional reaction whatsoever. Uh, that coolness combined with kindness is very, very powerful. And you think, when you think, yeah, if there are arahants in the world, this might be one of them. Yeah, this is what you expect arahants to be like. Yeah. I once asked Ajahn Brahm, and he said, well, if there's any arahants in the world, he, he, he pointed out two people, and one of them was Ajahn Ganha. I'm not going to say who the other one is, but anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, so I went to see this monk, and it's kind of really interesting, because what is so interesting about seeing these monks is that they understand what we really need, or how we should live, the right thing to do. So when he talked, and he gave a Dhamma talk, he was, it's so simple, yeah, it's so simple. He says, when you wake up in the morning, make sure you are kind to, the, to everyone around you all the time. Make sure you do something positive for the world today. When he, talks about, uh, <coughs> when he talks about right speech, this time when I was there, I talked a lot about right speech. Uh, and he reminded us that when you speak, uh, there's a possibility of being kind and caring to the people around us. Because speech is so powerful. You know how you can detract from pe other people's happiness by speaking in a harsh way? Uh, and you feel really bad, you feel kind of on edge if people are too harsh. Uh, so he says, make sure you use your speech as an opportunity to do dana, to be generous. Uh, because it's powerful, this possibility of giving to people in your speech. You're, you're kind of expanding the idea of dana to include everything, all the precepts, everything you have. And that is very, very powerful. So 
remember that, but it's hard to always speak, never to lie, always to speak harmonious speech that brings people together, not to speak harsh speech, but gentle speech, uh, to speak speech that is meaningful uh, rather than idle chatter. That's the hardest one, the bottom one. Huh? A little bit of idle chatter is okay. Yeah. When I came in, I said, how are you? And you said, good, and that was it. That was the idle chatter. Short to the point, yeah, done. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so remember that. Uh, and you can really be a benefit to the people around you. If you take these basic teachings of Buddhism, yeah, and then apply those in the right way, and you grow inside. This is the thing, you really change inside. Uh, I don't know if you, I mean, I have been coming here for a few years now to, uh, to BGF, uh, and I really like to, c it's not very nice to come here, yeah, lots of Buddhists around, and it's always a good atmosphere, and all of these kind of things, uh, so I really enjoy coming here. But uh, if you look at me, you can probably see that I have changed a little bit over those five years. Uh, and why is that? Uh, because this is the nature of the path, you change as you go along, uh, yeah? You become more bright, you get all of these good qualities. And if I look back to what I was like 25 years ago, I've been a monk for 25 years now, it's a bit scary to think back what I was like. Uh, but what it tells me is that the path works. It does change you inside. You become gradually a different person. And one of the great things about seeing Ajahn Ganha, is like Ajahn Ganha is like the final product of this path. Yeah? Always bright, always aware, always cool. And when you see that, you realize this is something incredibly worthwhile. What else can you want in your life? This is it. This really is the end point of the path. You have all the happiness in the world. You have almost no dukkha. You never see Ajahn Gandha grimacing or looking sad. He never looks sad. He always looks happy and bright. Uh, how is that possible? I asked Ajahn, Shah, uh, Ajahn Brahm because uh, Ajahn Gandha came to Perth and he stayed with us for about six months. And I asked him, has Ajahn Gandha always been like this? And Ajahn Brahm said, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, so he, he must have become an Arahant very early on and have very strong spiritual qualities. Uh, so that gives you a feeling of the end point uh, and uh, the Teachings that he gives are these simple teachings, uh, teachings that we often forget. We think that meditation is what Buddhism is about. No, what Buddhism is about is a purification of your heart and your mind. That is what it really is about, and meditation is a tool on that path. Uh, but really, you can do so much more yeah, before you actually even come to meditation practice. Uh. So if you don't like to meditate, no problem, don't meditate. Yeah, It's all right, uh, but be kind. Whatever you do in your life, be kind. And this is really the kind of the final thing. I don't need to say more than that, really. Uh, that's the final thing. Uh, if you can work on that kindness, improve it, go in the right direction, uh, then you will be one of those people uh, that when eventually you lie on your deathbed uh, and you're about to pass away, uh, you will feel content. Uh, you will feel happy because you have lived your life in a good way uh, and you have done the right thing. Yeah? That is such a beautiful thing. Uh, and if you take it even further, well, maybe you can even become like Ajahn Ganha. Okay, I'm not going to talk anymore, because uh, enough, yeah, I, I'm fed up of talking, so I'm going to stop there. <laughs> <laughs> so, please, if you wish to ask any questions, or you don't come too close to me because I have a bit of a fever and things, so you might get the flu, and we don't know whether it's coronavirus or not, so be, stay away, uh, stay away. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I'd also like to ask questions, can you go to the two mics here? Or raise your hands, I try to come to you. All, all these are recorded. You can go to BGF YouTube and uh, look at the videos. Because and also we are passing around donation boxes so that we can uh, give some funds to support Bodhiana. <coughs> and uh, you see Ang Pao rappers in the front. So uh, feel free to take it and offer to Achan. Okay, please so ask any, questions. Any, because any questions? You want to be wise, yeah? So if you want to be wise, you have to ask questions. That's the it's actually in the suttas. So. Uh, John, thank you very much. Yes. You are in fever and flu. You are still not, don't want to cancel the talk. <laughs> so we want to know the inspirations for continue this. Uh, just you are sick also still giving talk. Yeah. <laughs> No, <laughs> good. Uh, okay, that's very really kind of you to say that. Uh, so, uh, excellent. If you have some really stupid questions, they're the best ones. Remember that, yeah? I know people are often afraid to think that their questions are really stupid, huh? but usually that means it's good. Everyone is thinking that my question is stupid. So, 
Usually good. Okay, well, that's really nice of you. Maybe that it means you have compassion for me, so I can go back to her and relax. <laughs> okay, one, yeah, please. Uh, Ajahn, yeah. Uh, uh, who is the second monk that uh, Ajahn Brahm mentioned? I mean, the possibly an uh, Arahang? Who is the second monk? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what Ajahn Brahm said at the time, he said, he said uh, Lumpur Liam, that's what he said. Uh, Lumpur Liam, the abbot of Wat Papong. Uh, yeah, he took over after Ajahn Shah, so he was kind of, uh, so he, he would have been very powerful, otherwise Ajahn Shah wouldn't put him in that position, yeah? So Lumpur Liam and Ajahn Ganha. So uh, I, I don't think Ajahn Brahm would have said himself that, that, that monks don't do that, uh, so that's kind of uns more uncertain. Uh. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah. We oui. Over there. Yeah. Since nobody else is asking questions, I'll ask you something mm. uh, maybe a little bit uh, out of the, the, the track. But um, do you often meet um, Buddhist monastics from other traditions? Uh, for instance, about um, what you said tonight about um, uh, delusion uh, and uh, as a cause of uh, suffering, one of the causes of suffering. Do you discuss the thing, our, uh, points of view uh, of I don't know, maybe Zen uh, mon uh, monastics or from other yeah. tradition, uh, very similar, or maybe they like to emphasize other, uh, yeah, just out of curiosity. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, not really, not, not very much, because, uh, and, the, and the reason is very simple, because uh, what we base our teachings, on, uh, understanding of Dhamma and Buddhism on is actually the word of the Buddha, that's what we go back to, so that's really what I emphasize always. Uh, and because the word of the Buddha is still available in the world, uh, yeah, that's really the main source of inspiration for, you know, Ajahn Brahm, monks like myself, is becoming more and more common now around the world because people are starting to understand that they have been listening to all these other teachers, uh, yeah, but they forgot about the Buddha, <laughs> which is kind of very bad if you think about it. Uh, yeah? If you ask a person in the world, who is your teacher? Uh, they would never say the Buddha. They would say Ajahn Brahm, they would say Ajahn Ganha, they would say Rinpoche, so and so, they would say Aya, Samangala, they would say, <laughs> you know, and this is what people will say. And really, we should have more people saying, I take the Buddha as my teacher, because he started all of this. If he got it wrong, it's, everything is hopeless. So we must have to assume that he actually taught the right thing, otherwise, everything falls apart. So uh, that's what that's where I that's what what we usually do. So you don't really have to discuss so much with others. You discuss a little bit because uh, you know with any ancient scripture like that, uh, there's always a degree of interpretation, uh, understanding things right. So you have to discuss in that sense. Uh, so I do, but don't normally dis discuss with Zen monastics because they don't they don't even read those suttas. They read much later much later things. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Yes. Hello, Ajahn. Um, in this day, uh, it's very stressful at work and all to manage relationship. Um, in all the hustle and bustle, mm. how does one actually uh, seek happiness when he or she has to deal with anger, frustration, disappointment, especially um, coming from someone you love? Mm. who has betrayed you and all, how do you actually forgive the person and yeah. you know, go on the path of happiness again? Yeah, what you have to do is you have to, <coughs> one of the most powerful teachings of the Buddha is the teaching of non-self. Yeah, that there is no entity or inherent essence in the human being. And what that idea of non-self really means is that uh, what we are as human beings, we are conditioned phenomena. Do you feel like a conditioned phenomena? You don't, you don't, may not feel like that, yeah, because the reason is because you f it feels like you have a will, it feels like all these kind of things, but we are conditioned phenomena. And because we are conditioned phenomena, people, it's very hard to make r people responsible for what they are doing. People don't know what they are doing. Yeah? People have no clue. Huh? People get angry, people betray you, people do all kinds of things, uh, not really understanding what they're doing. They are creating enormous amount of suffering for themselves, much more than the 
uh, making for you. Yeah, you have to bear, bear the brunt of some of that, but actually they're creating far, far more for themselves because they're the ones who have the bad intention. Uh, so you just have to remember that this is the way people are. Yeah, you have to choose wisely. Yeah, this is one of the things. It's so it's very hard to choose wisely. We don't know who is going to be the right person, but uh, that's really what it comes down to. Uh, so um, accept people for their problems. Don't try to change people around you. Too often we like to try to change other people, uh, but you can't do that really. It's impossible because other people come with their own conditioning, their own background. They are who they are, and then. Uh, you know, it's not going to work. Yeah. So if you want to change other people, you have to be very patient. Uh, and uh, you can do a little bit. You can maybe invite them to a Dhamma talk, or you can kind of you know, do little things like that and see if things turn out right. Uh, but uh, in the end, you have to always remember that it's uncertain uh, and unreliable. No idea whether it's going to work out for you or not. Uh, and that is, the, uh, that, that, that is the problem. So you have to understand the world in the right way. This is part of this understanding of Anicca. Yeah, impermanent, unreliable. Everything is unreliable. You shouldn't really be surprised when things are so unreliable. You shouldn't be surprised when someone, you know, does bad things to you because that's kind of part and parcel of, of life. Really, they betray you or whatever. Yeah. Does <coughs> that make any sense? Kind of. <laughs> these are things you have to think about. Yeah, again and again. These are deep kind of realities of uh, of human existence. And uh, it, is, it leads to forgiveness, because once you understand that people are really just hurting themselves, nobody wants to hurt themselves, and yet that's what they do, then you start to have compassion for them, yeah? Because they're foolish, that's the problem. Huh? And then you can forgive, huh? and then you can let go of those things. Huh? Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Raise your hands, I come to you. Hi Ajahn. Uh, the other night uh, you had a, you gave a talk, and I was saying that uh, I was asking: Do people should people just exist or leave? Remember? Sh should they? People take just exist. Exi oh yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That right. Okay. That was from you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. And uh, yeah. at the beginning of yeah. your talk, yeah. you were saying people just get born, yeah. and then they just do stuff, and before they know it, they're on the deathbed, right? Yeah. That's exactly what I meant, actually. Mm, That's mm. called existing. Mm, mm. They exist, but they don't leave. Yeah. That's what I meant. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. Because yeah. the other night, you actually yeah. couldn't quite understand what I, I was asking. Sure. Yeah, but then leaving, uh, of course, means like really doing things. And uh, like what Ajahn said, that uh, you have achieved, mm. right? Uh, certain things. Mm. So I just wanted to say this. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. <coughs> keep keep the questions flowing fast because uh, otherwise our channel will just stop the talk. <laughs> I think it's probably time for me to go anyway, uh, Bobby. I don't feel I don't feel yeah. all, all that great. It's maybe time to call it a day. Yeah, yeah? a li little bit shorter than usual. I hope you will forgive me. Otherwise, <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs>